Um, welcome to all of you uh, that are here today on this busy, busy day at Sequoias. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephanie Pina Escudero, who will talk uh, with us this afternoon about ways to address and deal with chronic pain. Dr. Pina Escudero received her medical training in both internal medicine and geriatrics at the Universal, Universal National, National Autonomo de Mexico. She is currently working at UCSF in developing education to uh, dealing with uh, people in developing education for those who are dealing with palliative and end-of-life care that aims to help clinicians provide care that includes pain management. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pina Escudero and give thought to any specific issues and questions that you might have to want to bring up to her. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay. If you're not able to hear me or if you're not able to understand anything of what I'm saying, please stop me and tell me, hey, I'm not getting it. Okay? Uh, thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. Thanks, thanks to you and thank you, uh, thanks to the Health Committee for the invitation. I am very happy to be here with you. And, well, some disclosures first. Uh, English is not my first language, as you <coughs> might have imagined by now. So also, if, you are, if any of the things that I say turn out to be appropriate, please let me know. And also, that since I come from UCSF as a university, I am not able to give any like specific recommendations, like prescription about any drugs, but I am able to solve any general doubts that you might have. Uh, if there's something that I don't know, I will go look uh, look it up and then give you an answer, all right? And I'm, I will try to do my best today. And I'm really, really honored to be with you. So dealing with chronic pain. My final disclosure before starting my talk is that I myself have been dealing with chronic pain for the last 10 years of my life. So it's like the most Silly injury that I might have gotten. Uh, when I was 22, I was in the ICU. And I didn't really have like a very skilled nurse as some of you guys are. So she put the blood pressure cuff on me. And she thought it was a good idea to be taking my blood pressure every five minutes for the whole month that I was in the ICU. <laughs> So I was unconscious, I was not able to say, hey, this is hurting, or hey, this is happening to me. So you might imagine how my nerves and my muscles got crushed after a month of, you know, taking my blood pressure every five minutes. So I, I have a little bit of an idea of what living with chronic pain is, and I might be able to answer you some questions from the, perspe from the perspective of the patient as well as from the perspective of the doctor. So for today's talk, we have, um, I have prepared more of a lecture kind of thing. And I'm trying to answer some of the questions that I, that I was told you might be interested in. But if you have any other ideas, want to take a different direction, you can totally let me know, OK? And let's get started. So I would like any of you to tell me what you think pain is. It hurts. Okay. A signal that something is wrong. A signal that something is wrong. It interrupts your lifestyle. It interrupts your lifestyle. Something else? Inflammation. Inflammation. All right. Very well. Let's take a look at like the official definition. So, pain is defined as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. And I'm going to stop here because I want to take you to take a look at the words that I highlighted, sensory and emotional, which resonates with everything that you just said. You know, it's something that 
you can only feel. I cannot come and put you a pain monitor and tell you, hey, you have 38 degrees of pain on your shoulder and you have zero in your leg and maybe 40 in your other leg. So there is no way of me telling somebody is in pain. There is no way that I can actually come and say, hey, you have this amount of pain. I entirely rely on what you feel, on what you think, on what you communicate as pain. And that is very, very, very important because nobody, no matter what I say, no matter what anybody else says, is going to understand your own pain as you do. You are like the only person that is able to feel things as they are. Now there are some signs that we can pick up on how much pain might that person be feeling, and that is the second part of the definition. So this experience is primarily associated with tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. And what does this mean? That if you're injured by this little object right here, I might assume that if you have a very little injury, you will have less pain than if you're hurt by this pair on the other side of the screen, right? That is one way of saying it. And maybe I can have some indirect indicators, like maybe your blood pressure rises, or your heartbeat goes up, or you are in tears. Those are things that might suggest to me that you might be in pain. But that is oftentimes more accurate of what acute pain is, of some injury that occurs in the moment. But as we'll see, as pain turns chronic, all of these things might not always be true, and the damage might not be proportionate to what the original injury was. So when is pain considered chronic? We can see their pain to be chronic after the third month you have been feeling it. Why is this? Because doctors consider that you have already given enough time to your body to heal whatever injury you had, and it shouldn't be hurting anymore. If after three months it, still, it is still hurting, then it is considered chronic pain, and that is what we're going to talk about today. Now, how many adults have chronic pain in this country? A lot. 2016 was like this large survey, or the last large survey that actually went asking people, hey, are you in chronic pain? Are you in chronic pain? And the data was released in 2018 after analyzing it, and 50 million people said, I have chronic pain. And from these 50 million people, almost 20 million had chronic pain severe enough to impair the way they function, to impair the things they like, to impair their life in some way, which they call high impact chronic pain. So it is very common. So the odds are that some of us here have it. Can you raise your hand if you are dealing right now with some sort of chronic pain? Okay, so a lot of us, all right. What are some risk factors for chronic pain? Well, being a male. For some reason, nature didn't make men as strong as women. <laughs> so, it's more often the times when men are going to turn that pain or that acute pain into a chronic problem. Poor physical activity, and this refers to how many exercises have you done through your life and how, many, uh, how much exercise are you doing right now. People that are active or that have been active through life tend to develop less chronic pain than those who are more sedentary. For nutrition, as we said, a lot of the components of pain are about healing, right? If you're not healing, it is going to still hurt. So poor nutrition is very related to healing impairments, you know? It's like if you are deficient in vitamins, if you are deficient in proteins, if you are deficient in um, the essential nutrients, you are going to have trouble healing and therefore you're going to be a, more prone to develop chronic pain. And the opposite is also true, obesity. And because of two reasons, not only because, of, okay, if you have, I don't know, a hurt foot or a hurt knee, you're going to be putting more weight on it, but also because obesity is an inflammatory state. And pain, as you guys mentioned, has a lot to do with inflammation. So if you are in a constant inflammatory state, it will be more likely for you to develop chronic pain than a person that is not obese. Multimorbidity, okay, there are a lot of diseases that have to do with pain. 
diabetes, gout, rheumatoid arthritis, etc. So as we age, as we live longer, we also have the opportunity to collect more chronic diseases. <laughs> and that also gives us a higher chance of getting pain from one of the diseases that we acquire through life. Surgical or medical interventions. So another risk factor for pain are post-operative post status because when they operate on you, they cut everything. They cut skin, they cut muscles, they cut nerves. And yes, maybe your internal organs get very, very nicely rearranged and cured and everything. But the last thing that doctors consider when they operate on you is the healing of the rest of the structures. And sometimes the nerves doesn't heal as smoothly as they originally were, and this might cause pain for the rest of your life or for a prolonged period of time. Mental health issues. So people that deal with depression, that deal with anxiety, that have like negative beliefs about pain, and we will talk about this a little bit later, are more likely to experience chronic pain. Sleep disorders. Of course, there is a vicious cycle. If you have pain, you can't sleep. But also, sleep is very, very important for you to regenerate things. And if you have problems sleeping, then you're also going to have problems healing, and that makes you also more vulnerable to chronic pain. And genetics. Even though there are very few diseases or very few families that actually have chronic pain as a purely genetic cause, there is a part of our genetic information that influences how much pain do we feel. So for some people, the same stimulus can feel very, very soft, and for others, it might feel very, very, very hard. And why do we feel pain? Why do we, do, why we need this? Can somebody turn it off? Well, not that easy. Because pain is our alarm system, and having pain protects us from ourselves, from the rest of the people, and from the environment. People that cannot feel pain, for example, can hurt themselves super easily as closing their fists because they don't know how hard to close their fists not to hurt themselves. And they often end up with their teeth being pulled out because they cannot feel how strongly they need to, cl to close their mouth not to hurt their lips, not to hurt their tongues. So it is a very important mechanism that keeps us alive. But it is also true that it can be bothersome some other times when it's not necessary. Oh, I, sorry. I'm destroying this microphone already. Okay. Can you hear me okay there? Yeah. Okay, good. So how does the pain system work? Well, let's imagine you have a minor injury in your thumb. So yeah, your thumb is very, very angry, but what is going to happen is that like the immediate response is that the cells that you crushed are going to free some substances that are going to make your thumb go red and go very, very sensitive. So even if you touch something as soft as a tissue, it will hurt, because what your body is trying to do is to protect the part that you injured. So it's like, okay, no. Don't let it touch anything until it heals. Please protect it. And the second part of the response is the systemic response. So how to think about this? All right. Like the most classically way that this is described is like the hard wire in a house. So when you turn on a switch, there are wires that go into the wall, and there are um, these joint boxes on the ceiling. And from the joint box, then you get the light bulb and it turns on. So you turn the switch on and the light bulb goes on. And if you control the pain, you uh, let your thumb heal, then it's like turning the switch off and the light bulb will go off, right? Except that in your body, these switches are called nociceptors. So nociceptors comes from a Latin word that's nocere, that means pain, so that is a receptor of pain. So if you turn on the pain, they go to the joint box that is in your spinal cord and from here to your brain. 
and it turns on the pain alarm. Something is going on, right? And so it feels that it is very simple and it would be just like this if we lived in a paper two-dimensional world. Because in real life, we were talking about this. The body has a little bit more plasticity. I'm going to go up just to show you something that's important. So this is a nerve that comes from the thumb. And supposedly, it is supposed to connect with the brain, with the nerve that goes to the brain and take the, the signal as I just described. The way that nerves connect are through these bundles here that have substances that are called neurotransmitters, serotonin, etc., that transmit the electric sign to the next nerve. And so, when this gets released, if this was paper, they would go straight to here. But since we are in three dimensions, they go up, they go down, they go and they stimulate some cells that are around as well, you know? And a long time ago, we used to think that in our spinal cord there were only nerves. But no, there are these glial cells that are there not just to give support to the nerves, as everybody believed, but they do have a very, very, very important function. And when they are stimulated for a very long time, they get activated, they get big, they start to communicate and they are starting to transmit these signals to other cells, to other nerves. If this happens over time, it's as if you turn down the light on your wall, expecting the light bulb to go on, and it turns out that your dishwasher goes on. Or it turns out that uh, your toilet flushes. So it starts to be a mess. It completely, when pain goes on for a very long time, it completely rewires the way that you feel that pain. And the nerves that are affected are not only the nerves that are around the place that you got hurt. As we will see, there are other nerves that also start to be affected. And what happens? That you're like that all the time, right? You are, you are saying to yourself, watch out, slow down, hazard, fear. And you start going like very, very tense all the time. Now imagine being like this for months and months and months and months. So as I told you, you get rewired. Some of these rewirings, that your body does, he thinks that they are smart rewires. So we were saying, hey, okay, you feel pain, it gets red, it gets tender, you take it away from the stimulus and it, and it heals. So your body starts thinking, hey, well, if that is a cure, let me give you more pain receptors so that you can take everything away. It's like, why is it still hurting? It has been such a long time and it makes you so, so sensitive that if somebody touches you, it starts hurting. And it doesn't have anything to do with the original injury. Another thing that your body thinks is a smart thing to do is, all right, so you are not paying attention to me. This pain has been going on for a very long time. Let's send a bigger stimulus. So instead of hurting this much, it's going to hurt this much. And even though you might seem to have this very little injury, you start feeling this big pain. And now it's not only your thumb, it's your arm, it's everything, it's everything around your body that starts hurting that doesn't have to do with the original injury. That, of course, starts to affect your cognition. You can only pay attention to that pain. It starts to be very, very bothersome. It has been there for such a long time. And it starts affecting your emotions as well, the way that you perceive the world. It is not the same to be in pain a day than to be in pain 20 years. I think we can all agree on that, right? And there is not only like this 
chemical layer that I am talking to you about. It is your individual perception of pain. So yes, there is a lot of biology, but there is also how do I perceive what's happening to me. In my culture, for example, there is a lot of people that have diabetes. And they go around like, well, yeah, you know, I know I am diabetic. I know the doctor told me to eat well like 30 years ago, and I didn't. And I know the doctor told me to have my meds, and eh, some days I did, sometimes I don't. Now I have like this big neuropathy, I am in pain all the time, but you know, it's a good trade-off. So pain is going to affect a person that thinks like that, very different to a person that thinks that pain is the worst thing that could have ever happened to him or to her. You know, it's like, if I have this little pain, I'm gonna die. Of course, the perception of pain is going to be very, very different. And that is something that you need to think about yourself individually. You know, it's like, where am I? What does pain mean to me? You know, it's like, am I in this, I don't really care as long as I can eat what I want, drink what I want, do what I want? Or is it something that's really, really, really bothersome to me? You know, it's like, I want to go through life being painless. There, is this feeling, there are these feelings of control. So there was this experiments in kids, and they hurt them, like with the same stimulus. But those kids that said, hey, I am in control of this, felt that pain was this big, as opposed to kids that said, no, I have no control over this, and here somebody's hurting me. They, fe they, they, they felt that the same stimulus hurt it this much. So how much control we do have on our pain seems to affect. And the environment. So they made this experiment. They put a, a cold stick on somebody's hand and they said that it hurted more when they were looking at red light as opposed to when they were looking at blue light. And I think we can all relate to that when we are like in a party and we're at the center of the party and we fall down and everybody's looking at us. So we kind of try to, you know, like stand up very uh, quickly and we're like, nope, nothing happened, nothing hurt it, I'm okay, and try to go on with our lives. And it really hurts less than if we actually fell down on our own. And it's like, oh, this has been like the worst fall ever. I, I am in so much pain. And, and then you start crying, you know? So the environment is, says a lot on how we perceive pain. And the social support that we have. So people that have family and friends, supporting them through pain, actually feel less pain or report less pain than people that do not have the support when they are actually craving for it, you know? There are people that manage very well on their own, but there are some people that are not like that. So with all this, I just wanted to, to let you know that pain is not just pain. Pain is like this complex disease on its own. It has many layers. It's the physical part, is the emotional part, is the environmental part, is the social part, etc. And all uh, the cognitive part, all of these are part of a disease on its own that's called chronic pain. That is why it is so hard to manage. And that is why it needs so many people managing it at the same time. I would like you um, now to share, if somebody's willing to share, where do you think you are with your pain? You know, it's like, how do you think it affects you not only physically, but in another sphere than the ones uh, of, of the ones that I've just described? Like, it alters your social life, it alters your mood, it alters the way you pay attention. I would like one of you to tell me how you feel about it, just as an example. You Sure. I have spider stenosis. Mm -hmm. I used to get the shots, cortisone shots, for one year. 
and then they had to stop. And now they don't have any other way than just take pain medication. And that's not doing very well. Okay. Somebody else? What is that? You know what? No. No, I just want to know what spider, what your problem is. What spider? Oh, what, what spinal is stenosis it? is? What, well, it's this <coughs> degenerated spine, uh, spine, the lumbar mm -hmm. spine. Yeah. Yeah, so lumbar stenosis is when your spine starts degenerating, but it starts getting like, the, the bone starts getting like thicker um, to the center of the, of, the, of the spine. So it starts compressing the nerves that are inside of your yes. spine. And that is what hurts. Yeah. That is what spinal stenosis is. Mm -hmm. no. yeah. Thank you. All right. So uh, a little bit of what I'm hearing, and correct me, sorry. Correct me if I am. I don't know if you really can hear me or not, but you will notice what you better there? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Good. So, um, correct me if I am wrong, but from what I felt that you were transmitting is like a sense of there's nothing else to do. That's right. Right? Okay. Somebody else? All right. Now let's move on. Because sometimes we in med school, we don't always learn the management of chronic pain appropriately. So I gave you this very, very long introduction to make you realize how complex the problem is and from how many angles we, will, we need to tackle this, not just pain medications. It is true. It is true that conditions of aging like arthritis, uh, like surgeries that needed to be done and are not able to be done for uh, numerous reasons, etc., are going to leave a uh, painful stimulus. But I think the message is that, yes, there might not be a cure to that particular condition, and we might need to learn with the pain as a new condition, but there is always a way that we can find to manage it. And your doctor needs to tailor, to tailor that plan with you. So, what is extremely important for you when you go to the doctor, it's like, okay, you're in the doctor's office. What is extremely important for you to tell to the doctor? Everything you know about the pain. Because as I described, there is no way that, I can, that you can come and sit up in front of me and I can actually Say, oh, yeah, of course, you are having this type of pain of this intensity, etc. No, you need to tell me. You are much more well informed about what's going on than what I, what I am ever going to be able to sense. So important things. For how long have you had the pain? We've already talked that if it has been going on for more than three months, the doctor's mind is immediately going to shift to, oh, okay, what I'm seeing is a type of chronic pain. And that will take him in a very, very, very different way, as in, oh, I hurt my thumb yesterday. Where does it hurt? Now, it is very important for you to tell everywhere where it hurts, because that helps us like know how the, how the pain is related to the damage of the structures. So if you tell me, okay, it hurts here and here and here and here, then I might imagine, oh, that is following like a nerve trajectory. Okay, then your nerves might be hurted. Oh, it hurts here and here and here. Oh, okay, maybe that is a muscular problem. Or there are some things that are so super unrelated. It's like, for example, liver issues relate to shoulder problems. And shoulder problems might actually be more hurtful than the liver itself. So if you come and tell me just about your shoulder issue and you don't tell me that, oh, by the way, and it hurts a little bit here, then I will give all my attention to your shoulder when the actual problem was in the liver. And I'm not going to solve anything, okay? So it is very important for you to communicate that. Uh, how the pain is, is important as well because, believe me, and I, I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but this is how it happens. If you come into the office and you say, all right, please tell me what you feel, and you start going like, I feel pain. 
Yeah, but how is it pain? Like pain. Yeah, but how is it pain? You know, it's like, um, like as if somebody was stabbing you, is it an oppressive pain? Like pain. Then what is going to happen is that the doctor is going to shut his curtain off and he's going to go like, uh-huh, 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 all right, yeah, take this. See you never, you know? So if you cannot find a fine way to describe your pain, I'm going to give you some tips. And at least try to um, make it as close as any of these sensations as possible. So, nerves, usually they burn or they feel numb. So if you have one of those sensations or close to that, say it burns. Um, usually internal organs, um, they feel like, um, how do you call it, I'm missing the word like a cramp. Usually when an internal organ hurts, it feels like a cramp or like a stab. So if you can make it, it's like, oh, there's something inside of me that hurts. I don't know what I am feeling. Yeah, because it is often more diffuse than when muscles hurt or bones hurt. It is often more diffuse. Just say, it feels like a cramp and that's it, okay? If, uh, usually muscles or bones tend to feel uh, like oppressive or throbbing. So if you're sure that you hurt a muscle, at least you go to the doctor and say, you know, it feels like an oppressive pain. And if you use these very, very basic cues, mm -hmm. your doctor is going to love you and it's going to help you a lot <laughs> much than if you just go and say, it hurts. Um, things that make it better or worse. Sometimes, you need to observe how your pain goes. Because we tend to generalize the pain. We just see you like five minutes in the consultation, but you live with yourself 24-7, you know? So if you know, hey, maybe it hurts more before going to bed, what the doctor is going to say, well, maybe I'm going to increase your medication, but just before going to bed instead of increasing, you, increasing it in the morning when the problem is before going to bed. You are not going to feel any better. So it is important for him to tell him, okay, this makes it worse, this makes it better, maybe this position makes it worse, maybe this position makes it better, and, oh, sorry. It's okay, I don't need it. And, uh, the intensity, and we're gonna see about that. All right, so there are some ways that we prescribe analgesics, right? One is, one is for persistent pain, and sometimes we do have, I don't know, let's say, I have a mild persistent pain, but when I do exercise, then the pain increases to a super severe pain. Or I have a super severe pain, but if I take a shower, it decreases to a mild pain. And maybe, as I told you, the adjustments of medications can just be for specific moments, and that will uh, save you adverse events. And the pain intensity scale, for you to know, this is what we use. As we have no pain monitor, it's like, okay, the closest we get to know how much is something hurting you is from one to 10. <coughs> Zero being no pain, and 10 being unbearable. And the way we, that we as doctors tend to think about it is, if you say less than four, then we, tr we tend to think about it as mild. If you say four to seven, we tend to think about it as moderate. If, we, if you say eight, nine, or 10, we tend to think about it as severe. And this is important because maybe for you it's like, yes, it is moderate, but for you moderate means a two. So if you go to a doctor and tell the doctor, yeah, I feel it too, even though in your mind it is moderate, for the doctor it might mean something different. So I guess just giving you these tips might actually help you explain it better to the doctor. And something that nobody ever asks us to do, but I will because it is important, is how does the pain affect your activities? This is Super important for treatment because let's say this puzzle takes you usually 10 minutes, right? But if you're the blue person and you start feeling pain, 
you will be able to complete the puzzle, but when you're feeling the pain, it will take you 20 minutes to complete it. If you're the person in red, you will get so distracted by the pain that you will not be able to complete the puzzle at all. If you're the person in black and you're in pain, actually that stimulates you and you complete the task in seven minutes. And if you are the person in like brown, and you say, well, you know, I had to kill my mind and I completed the puzzle in the 10 minutes that I had or that I usually do. It is very different. I'm going to tell you why. Because when you tell us or when you realize how does pain affect the activities and what activities does it affect, we can help you better. The goal Yes, is to establish a multidisciplinary plan that might have a lot of things, but you need to have your own goal. As I told you, it's like, what is this pain affecting? Me as a doctor, for me it might be important, you know, okay, maybe for me it is important for you to wake up and fix yourself breakfast. <coughs> that might be my priority as a doctor. But you tell me, hey, but I live in Sequoia, somebody cooks for me, you know? <laughs> It's like, why do I need to cook my own breakfast? It makes no sense. What is important for me is that I can sit down in the evenings and knead whatever I am needing. That is what I need the pain for, uh, control for. Or maybe it's like you are thinking, okay, uh, the doctor might be thinking, oh, you have to be able to go up and down the stairs. Again, doctor, I have an elevator. That is not super important for me. I, I better like to sit with my friends and, I, and be able to enjoy a conversation. So you need to really see what is that you are willing to achieve to do despite the pain. That is a very important question that you need to know. For example, for you, what would be important to, to be able to do despite feeling pain? Take a walk. Take a walk, okay. Uh, how about for you? For either of you. <laughs> Martial arts. Martial arts? For you? I don't have But if you had, what would be important? Probably get up and move. Get up and move, all right. And how about you? I'm thinking, I'm thinking. <laughs> Ask the question again. What would be important for you to keep on doing despite having pain? Travel. Travel, okay. So it is way different, you know, like the amount of medication, the amount of treatment, the type of activities I'm thinking about to get you to travel, to get you to do your martial arts, than to let somebody just wake up in the morning, you know? So it is extremely important for you to have clear, hey, what do I really want to do so that my pain can get managed in that direction? We'll see some management. All right. Now, another important thing to consider is, okay, the beauty of medicine in older adults. I am a geriatrician, right? So. We get taught in medical school, hey, well, yeah, we have this and 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 these options for pain. And for older adults, that huge list reduces like to this amount of things. So you have to be like very smart, very aware, very communicate. Uh, you, you need to have a very good communication with your doctor and the doctor needs to have a very good communication with you in order to uh, help you understand this. Because treatment is going to be a very long process and it's going to require a long follow-up. For example, with you, for how long have you been receiving management for your spinal stenosis? For how long have you been receiving management for your spinal stenosis? Many years. Many years, okay. And is it zero? Yes. 
getting worse because I'm getting older. Exactly. Okay, so far from getting better, it's getting worse. All right. So, yeah, usually it is very important to let people know that this is going to be a very long process, and sometimes doctors don't tell you that. You know, they, they tell you, hey, yeah, okay, take this analgesics, and you think that if you go home and take them for a, a couple of weeks, you will be fine. The second thing is control of comorbidities. As I was telling you, there are some diseases that need to be controlled in order for pain to be controlled. If you are diabetic, your sugar needs to be controlled for your neuropathic pain to be controlled. If you have gout, your gout needs to be controlled for your pain to be controlled. Uh, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, it needs to be controlled for your pain to be controlled. So the, it is not just managing the pain, you need to be very strict with the management of the rest of the diseases that you have as well and set reasonable goals as a success. If I told you, for example, okay, you're not going to have zero pain, but you're going to have, let's say, a three that will allow you to travel to Greece. Would that be okay? Okay, even though it's not zero, right? Yes. I mean, because, yeah. because sometimes that is something that we're craving for. You know, it's like, take this pain away from me. I don't want it. But if we actually set the goal at please help me do what I want to do or what I need to do, then that is a completely different mindset and it's more doable and you're going to get less frustrated, the doctor is going to get less frustrated and you're going to be able to live happier and better, which is the ultimate goal, I believe. That's point number four, prioritize functionality. Why do you want to do this by having pain? And the other thing is drugs are metabolized differently in older adults. So, some of you might know this, some of you might not, but drugs are almost never tested in older adults. So the drugs that we use for pain, the drugs that we use for whatever disease you can think about, are tested in younger people because the metabolism of older adults is different. And oftentimes, the adverse effects that occur on, in older adults are not in the box. Some of these are falls, or delirium, or adverse effects that are more often uh, found in older adults. But if you read it, if you read what the doctor gives you, you're not going to find these adverse effects. So that's why we need to start with a very low dose and go very slow. So probably when you start the management of pain, you're going to receive a dose that doesn't have to do with pain at all, that just has to do with seeing if you tolerate the drug or not, if the adverse effects uh, present or not. So this makes it a very long process, and I understand that it is a very tiring process, but it is also a necessary process to ensure that you are safe. So what is what we typically do? The World Health Organization gives us these guidelines. You know, it's like if you have mild pain, don't use opioids. If you have moderate pain, you can see they're using them. If you have severe pain, use them. That's it. So how do we start? All right, mild pain. For seniors, we have this amazing pharmacy of options. <laughs> That's it. So if you, if you have Muscular pain or any other type of that's not neuropathic pain, what we have to prescribe is acetaminophen. And if you have neuropathic pain, probably gabapentin or pregabalin. So now what happens with drugs like ibuprofen or naproxen or all, all these others that are much better than acetaminophen? Well, in older adults, they do have a lot of adverse effects and we cannot use them for very prolonged period of times. I'm sure, for example, for you, these kind of drugs will do much better for your spinal stenosis, but if I gave them to you, then your, um, your belly might start bleeding, your kidneys might start failing. So it is a very big trade-off, you know, instead of like, okay, how much pain control do I want? How much do I want this person alive? You know? And drugs like gabapentin and progabalin can't be used in the doses that are used in younger adults. Yeah, they need to be given in very, very, very low doses. So what do we do? 
we use other kinds of stuff. Um, deep heating rubs, using warm and cold, using, uh, for example, we can use a diclofenac cream because it is topic. It doesn't have those adverse effects that systemic ibuprofen has, for example. We do have for neuropathic pain, pain capsaicin. So what is this? This is a substance that is found in hot peppers. And in the same way that in your tongue, uh, yeah, that in your tongue when you eat a lot, it is so stimulated that it just turns off. That is what it does with your nerves. And for example, for some conditions like shingles, that after having shingles you might have a lot of pain, we might also use like lidocaine patches or other topical measures. And there are antidepressants. Okay, so as we saw, antidepressants are not only because you're sad, because you are in a low mood, because you think you're going to die. It's because in the same pathway of chronic pain, the, the substances that are used to heal, and one of the most important substances is serotonin that is in your platelets, is going all to the area that hurts. And it's not, and it's leaving anything in your brain. That's why you get depressed. But also, if you're using it all, you have nothing. And if you start taking it, it might actually hurt with, uh, help with pain, especially with neuropathic pain. So when when a doctor gives you an antidepressant, it's not always for depression. It is because it actually helps with pain. <clears throat> Then comes physical therapy. Physical therapy helps with virtually all types of pain. So if you have pain and you are not on it, this is definitely something you want to get on. Uh, it, it should be individualized. And something that is important is because sometimes you also get desperate out of this. If you have arthritis, spinal stenosis, uh, Muscular issues, especially, they tell us, they tell you that if you make the muscles around the joint that hurts stronger, then you're not going to uh, bear so much weight on that joint and it is going to hurt less, which, yes, is true. A little bit of the problem is that since older adults take longer to make muscle mass, they also need a lot more exercise than younger adults would need. And they need to do it for a long period of time. So once you're on it, you cannot go off it. Okay? It will help a lot, but it is important for you to know that it's something that's going to be permanent, that you cannot just stop doing one day. So as you see, it is a very interesting lifestyle, the one of current pain. And again, functionality is a goal. For you, it is important to do some martial arts. So maybe the therapy that you will get will be focused more on getting the muscles that you would need for your martial arts going on, as opposed to the muscles that you would need to travel, right? I mean, maybe you will need stronger legs, maybe you will need stronger arms, and maybe where it hurts is like somewhere in between, well, you need to manage in order to get what you want to do done. And in that way, I think it's a very good deal. You know, it's like, okay, I might go travel if I go to my daily session for a while. And an external focus. Why did I put that image? All right, so let me explain something to you. If you focus on your body, all you're going to feel is the pain. It's like, one. Two, no, no more, it hurts, stop it. But they did it with young adults, and they put them in these boards. And when they told them, all right, you need to focus on whatever your body needs to do to get this board not falling down from that cylinder, 100% of the time, these professionals fell down. When they told them, focus on getting the board steady over the cylinder, None of them fell down. So if you change your mind when you're doing your rehab, it's like, okay, it's not how I feel when I am punching something. It's I'm going to punch that thing 10 times. 
no matter what my body does, and you picture yourself on the 10 times rather than on what your body's feeling, you're going to have a better result. You're going to do it better. If it's like, okay, I need to put that ball in that exit sign, and you're like, okay, what does my body need to do? Carry the ball this way? You're never going to hit the exit sign. If you focus on putting the ball on the exit sign, your body will do the work. So whenever you're doing rehab, if you focus more on, okay, I'm going to do this 10 times, rather than, let's see how my body feels if I do this, you're going to be able to do it better. If you are like, okay, what do I need to do? Get from here to there? Okay, what I'm, what I'm going to focus is on touching the phone rather than on the process of walking all the way to the phone. You're going to be more successful and your therapy is going to be less boring. <laughs> yeah. Okay, things that are some that have uh, in science shown some um, evidence that help. Massages, specifically for low back pain, like that, low, low back pain, and some tensional headache and shoulder pain. And acupuncture, it's still debated if it is or not a huge placebo. The fact is that in big, big, big studies, it has been shown that it is, even if it's a very tiny bit, better than placebo. So if you want to go ahead and try it, it does have scientific evidence that it works at least for musculoskeletal pain or sore arthritis, chronic headache and shoulder pain. So if you're on the list and you want to give it a try, there is actual scientific evidence that it might work. Yoga. So I know a lot of people here like yoga. And there is evidence for almost every type of chronic pain that yoga helps. And it helps the same way therapy helps because it it gives you muscle strength, it gives you more balance, it gives you better um, it gives you uh, better physical skills, but also because of what I was telling you. It's like, what do you need or how do you face pain? So if you're like this person that needs to kill your mind while you're doing something, yoga usually is very, is very good at doing this because they focus you on something that is not the pain while you're doing it. Tai Chi as well, specifically with osteoarthritis. But it is very important for you to consider these two things, that none of these disciplines should hurt. So if you're doing a yoga pose and it hurts, then something is wrong. You need to tell the instructor. If you're doing Tai Chi and it hurts, then something is wrong and you need to tell the instructor. Because these are not meant to, not even, these are not even meant to be working the part that hurts. They are meant to be working around what hurts. And emotional support. Well, we already said about mood, but this, this is a study that put together like all the evidence in the world of how mood regulated, like how much pain you were feeling. And if you're in a bad mood, you're going to have more intense and more unpleasant pain than if you're in a good mood. Things to, better, to make your mood better. There are a lot. The first one is simply doing something that you like. What is something that you like, for example? Painting. Painting, all right. Yeah. You? What is something that you like? Um, reading. Reading. And you? I'm not, I, couldn't, I didn't hear the question entirely. What is something that you like? I enjoy eating fresh fruit, for example. Okay. Uh, how about you? What is something that you like? Me? Mm -hmm. Cooking. Cooking, all right. So if you stay like active in the activities that you like, that is a recipe for pain. But if you're not able to, if you're like, I want to cook, but this pain is killing me. I really want to do this, but no, I'm in a super negative attitude. It's like, oh, if only I didn't have this pain, I would be like this great artist and I would paint a lot, <laughs> or, you know. So there are many attitudes around pain that prevent us from doing what we want. And there are many strategies to turn around that. One of that is therapy. 
it's not for everybody, but for the people that actually have like these very negative feelings, it's not like you're gonna sit down and say, oh, in my childhood, my dad, no. These kinds of therapies give you like very, very specific um, tasks for you to deal with pain. It's like, okay, we're going to work on that bad attitude that is preventing you from cooking. Or we're going to work on what you feel that would prevent you to, related to pain, of course, to prevent you from being like the greatest painter in the world. So you work specifically on that, and you work specifically on crisis. It's like, okay, I'm meeting with my friends, but then it starts hurting. What do I actually do? So they teach you relaxation techniques, they teach you how to face these situations, and it takes only like 12 to 20 sessions to get through this. So it is an option for the people that might actually want that support. There are others, biofeedback. So what to do? It's like, okay, I am in the middle of cooking this delicious, what do you like to cook? Um. Yeah, desserts or baking, bread. All right, um, I'm in my way of ma baking this delicious loaf of bread and there is this pain that makes me sweat and all that sweat is going to go into the bread. <laughs> so, all right. There are other techniques, let's say biofeedback, that can actually help you control that. You know, it's like, okay, when it hurts, you're gonna breathe like this, you're gonna do these movements, you're gonna do this, and that will prevent your sweat from going into your delicious loaf of bread. <laughs> there is also some evidence, even though it is very little, of hypnosis. So this is highly entirely based on suggestion. So if you think, you're like, okay, I'm gonna go, and I'm really, really going to believe what this person is going to do to me, and walk out with less pain, that might work. It might not, but I leave it there because there are some little studies that have actually showed there is some evidence. And better than that, there is self-hypnosis. There are also some studies that tell you, okay, you might set your own mind for this pain to be controlled. And they give you some techniques on how to do it, and you spend some time on doing it. So if you think this might work for you, give it a try. My dad is now super fascinating try, trying to hypnotize himself. And I think that more than the actual hypnosis, just the distraction or just trying to learn the technique has distracted him from the pain and he, he refers that he's feeling better. So, and meditation. Okay, so there is also like this uh, persons that need to find their center while they are in pain. So if you are one of these persons, meditation might be for you. There is evidence. I mean, of all these therapies that I am telling you, there is a scientific article that says, give it, a, give it a try. But you need to see what might work for you. Because if I come and recommend you, hey, you should go to hypnosis, maybe you're going to tell me, are you crazy? That's not for me. And this is another topic, religious and spiritual coping. So what does science say? Well, there is this super very interesting uh, article, and what they did was to put into uh, an MRI machine people, Catholic people, and they said, okay, we're going to give you a painful stimulus, and you're going to look at nothing, or you're going to look at Virgin Mary. And people that were inside of the MRI, their brains showed better coping with pain when they saw Virgin Mary than when they didn't. So that's what, that's from where people got the idea, hey, maybe religious and spirituality might be a good thing to help pain. But what has been described that has been good? When your spiritual practices or your religious practices focus on looking to a higher power for strength, for comfort, for support, like these people did with the image in the MRI, then that is a positive thing. When you use prayer as a source of strength, um, I come from a very Catholic country, and this is something that you often see. You know, it's like these very old ladies that are praying when they are in pain, and they do feel better. What has been seen that doesn't work, that actually makes 
pain worse when you are uh, when you have some certain types of religion beliefs. When in your religious beliefs, pain is a divine discipline. When pain is a divine um, chastisement or a God's punishment, then you feel worse with this religious practice, and you should probably look other ways of coping with pain. That is not spirituality. This is not uncommon. I mean, I have heard a lot. It's like. I don't know why God is punishing me with pain, uh, or people that think that they don't deserve to get treated because God gave this to them. So if that is the case, maybe religion is not the way that you should seek comfort for your pain. We already talked about this, people that like to talk. And I bring opioids until here. Because before receiving opioids, you should have had all of the above. So who is receiving all of the above for their pain? Is the question again? Yeah, so who, who is receiving like all of the things that we have been discussing about for their pain? Who is having actually medical support? physical support, emotional support, who's getting all of those things for their pain. Okay. It's less than, it's less than half of the people that actually raise their hands. Mm -hmm. So for the other people, there's still a long way to go because if you have moderate pain or severe pain that requires opioids, you should have had all of the things that we have discussed before. So now here I am putting this, and I just want you to see, okay, how bad, how, how acetaminophen works. So morphine, when, uh, morphine, like the oral presentation, is like our unit. So one tablet of morphine is equivalent to one over 360 uh, in pain efficacy of acetaminophen. But there are some things that are very commonly given, like codeine, which is one third as effective as morphine in the same amount. Oxycontin, that is 1.5, so it's more powerful than morphine itself. And it is also like uh, um, given, and hydrocodone, which is Vicodin, which is equivalent to morphine. But there are other substances, and I just want you to take a look at this, like heroin, which is five times stronger than morphine. Or buprenorphine, that is 40 times stronger than morphine but way less addictive because it doesn't give you the high and fentanyl which are like high, highly highly addictive but why am i bringing this up all of these medical uh, all of these meds as you can see are very effective for pain and when they are well prescribed there is no ceilings there there is not a highest dose that i can prescribe to a person i can prescribe to a person as much as they need, unless it's not well tolerated, okay? When they are used wisely, they are very, very good allies in the control of pain. But, well, let me, let me tell you something. Opioids have, I don't know if you, all of you can see, a lot of yellow dots on this side of the screen, but there are a lot of uh, places where opioids act in the brain and they act in your brain in order to get you through very important functions in your day. Uh, some of them have to do with your heart, some of them have to do with your weight, but between the, between the important things here is that they act in your spinal cord regulating pain. They act in your brain regulating pain. They act in the skin, in the muscles, regulating pain. So they regulate pain in a very, very wide variety of places, and that's why they are so effective. Because they can virtually eliminate or handle any type of pain, but they also act in centers of pleasure and motivation. So we said that you need all of these treatments before or with this.
There are a lot of people that use wrongly the prescription of opioids and they get addicted. And each day there are a lot of older adults that get addicted to opioids. That has two consequences. First, even though I told you, hey, opioids are the best medication in the world, there is no ceiling, I can give you as much as you want, is, does it still hurt? Yeah, here is more. People are very afraid to get addicted, so they prefer to be in pain. But at the same time, if you are in pain, you will be more prone to misuse a prescription to control the pain. So you need to, uh, you need to work with the physician and tell him, this is working, this is not working. And if you see the causes of addiction, is to relieve physical pain, to relax or relieve tension. But, as we, dis as we just said, if you did yoga, if you did cold and, uh, if you did cold and warm, if you did uh, your physical therapy, that would have been covered. And that is not a need that you would have that would get you into an addiction. To um, help with sleep. If you talk to your doctor and tell him, hey, I'm having problems sleeping, then you might work strategies other than you taking a lot of OxyContin to go to bed. Um, but if you just want to feel good or get high, well, there is not much to do about that. Stephanie. Yes. I just want to mention that the time, you know, we have this. Yeah, this is my uh, last slide. And I just want to say that it, you've given us a lot to think about. And because of the time frame for which we're scheduled to use this auditorium, I'm just wondering if it's time for people to bring up any particular Definitely. issues that haven't been touched or that they want to um, address, to bring up. Yeah, sure. I'd like to hear about this. Yes, I'd like All right. to hear about CBD. <laughs> then never mind. OK. So the way that I kind of set the tone of this presentation is because usually doctors present information this way, right? It's like, there is pain, there are adverse effects with medications, let's do these trade-offs, blah, 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 blah. The way CBD is announced, a perfect break from your stressful, hectic day. How does that make you feel, even when you read it? Oh, nice. Inviting. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, exactly. I mean, one of the things why CBD has become super, super famous, and one of the things that is super effective before going into what CBD is or how it acts, is because of this. It gives you a lot of self-control. We talked about self-control and how important it is for pain. So you see these as things that you have to do on a list. I have to do to my physical therapy. I have to take my medication. I have to lie, 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 lie. This is something that it's presented as you have an option of improving your day. You have an option of making your life better. So that immediately, even if this was just sugar, makes you feel better, right? So that is part of uh, the success of it. The other thing is, how does it act? Well, it acts on inflammation. It acts on these glial cells that I presented you are responsible or play a major role in chronic pain. And it modulates serotonin, which, yes, helps with pain, but also with mood. So if you take it, potentially, it reduces all the inflammation, it takes away the pain, it helps you with chronic pain, it, it acts as an, anti uh, as an antidepressant, so yeah, I bet it will make you feel better. There are some downsides though. I'm sorry. But again, this... What, what do you mean by modulates serotonin? Yes, so it acts as a, as an SSRI, so which, which means that when serotonin is low, you get depressed. What antidepressants do is try to gather the serotonin for you to use it and enhance your mood. That is exactly the same thing that CBD does. It gathers serotonin, don't let it go to waste, and enhance your mood, and makes you feel better. <clears throat> Again, this was not studied in older adults. It hasn't really 
been approved by the FDA for chronic pain. And what is something, or what are some things that I want you to keep in mind when using them? Because it seems to be like the perfect remedy to all that is hurting us. The way CBD acts in the brain microcellarium, the way it uh, acts on the immune system, might make us some, might make us more prone to infections, since it reduces inflammation. There are some articles that are wondering, does it reduce inflammation too much that actually you cannot defend from a pneumonia or from an ITU? That is something that is still there. The immune system of older adults works differently. It's a little bit weaker. So if on top of that you add something that might not um, let it work in an appropriate way, even though it controls pain, it might have some serious adverse events. Okay, so some just rapid conclusions and we will go with you with your questions is, pain that lasts for more than three months is called chronic. It is highly prevalent in this country. The mechanisms that generate chronic pain are different from the acute pain. It alters not just where it's hurt, it alters cognition, emotion, social life. It is important for you to provide as much information as possible to your doctor and the management is multidisciplinary and dynamic. And now I am open to everything you need to ask. <laughs> Maybe I should pass you the mic so everybody can hear yeah, your questions. I oh, okay. Also. Of course, I'm again. What about TENS treatments, TENS units? Oh, okay, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned it. Yeah, they are in, involved in physical therapy. So, they are very, very, very effective if done by a professional. Because the intensities that uh, are used in TENS vary according to what you are trying to treat and the region that you are trying to treat. So, professionals are trying to put the electrodes in the right places for the muscles to relax, for the nerves to uh, get stimulated and hurt less. Uh, so it is effective for muscular pain and it is also effective for nerve, nervous pain. It is not effective for conditions that are inflammatory. For example, if you have gout pain, it is not effective for that. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, it is not effective for that. But it is very effective for conditions like a muscular or a joint um, issues or nervous issues. Are you allowed to uh, discuss DMSO, dimethyl sulfate? <laughs> I've been using it on gout, and it's and it's basically stopped. Yeah. But I don't know how it how it works exactly. I guess nobody does. Yeah, nobody does. I mean, but you, are they are they working on making it legal? Or? The problem with all this, including like CBD and everything else, uh, is that we need in order for them to turn into medicine, you need to do clinical trials. So you would need to have a bunch of people for certain type of pain for a certain disease and give some of them the drug or a placebo and see what happens. And that is very, very, very expensive, that is time consuming. So even though these things might be effective, they are not yet categorized as medicine or they are, cannot be prescribed as medicine because that lack of studies. If I, if I give it to you and you have an adverse event, then it's like, well, yeah, it might have worked, but you weren't sure that all the safety issues were in place before prescribing it. But it is uh, just just so to say, it works a little bit like this. It has anti it has anti inflammatory properties. Uh, the I just read a research thing on serotonin that said that genetically some of us have shorter receptors and that those people have more pain 
not just depression, but more pain, and they're genetically predisposed to that. Is that correct? That is correct. It's called, well, we call it the happy gene. <laughs> so, yeah, there are some people that just have a happy gene and are able to capture more serotonin than others. And those people tend to be, yes, happier and less depressed, but also heal faster and feel less pain. That's you. I, I think I have shorties. <laughs> Yeah, here. Yeah. How is serotonin, how is that measured on people? What kind of a test do you have to have? And who do you ask? Do you ask your primary care if you're depressed? How do they know? Or how do you know? Yeah, well, there is... There is... Because I cannot say that there isn't. There is a way of measuring serotonin in blood, but we don't typically do it because it is very, very, very complicated. The way that we know these neurotransmitters are depleted are from experiments that we do in labs. <coughs> it's not the only thing that goes on. In real life, everything goes on. But if your symptoms are the ones of a depressed person, mm -hmm. then we assume that serotonin is low, and we give you the medicine to fix that. How long, so you said about pain, it becomes chronic if you've had it over three months. Mm -hmm. So if you're depressed, if you're if you think you're depressed, um, how long before you decide to go and get help to recognize? Will this pass in two weeks? X amount, two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. Yes. So, so you're yeah, for for, two for weeks, yes then. for for a doctor to diagnose clinical depression, two weeks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What else? I think I heard that you do end-of-life care, too. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, is, is anything changing in the way we manage people's pain and suffering at the end of life? Yes. So what actually changes is that we don't care about toxicity anymore. Care about we don't care about toxicity anymore. So as I was telling you, for example, our concerns with these drugs is, all right, maybe we don't want to mess up with your liver because you might be using it 20 more years. But if we mess with your liver and your life expectation is of two hours, it's like, honestly, it doesn't really matter. What I, what I do care about is that you are comfortable during these couple of hours. <laughs> So that is what changes. I mean, in terms of management of pain, uh, we don't really care about toxicity anymore, and we do give more focus on medications because some of the rest of the things are not being able to do by the person in the end of life. Something else? So thank you. Thank you.